Draft Mechanic is a proud member of Punchboard Media. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. Draft Mechanic, episode 104. On this episode of Draft Mechanic, we have a Kickstarter preview of the Always Green Garden. We discuss recent plays of Shikoku, Navigador, and The Hear Me's. We do our mid-year update on our 2018 game superlatives and favorite games lists, and we look at some interesting legal decisions in the craft beer sphere. So sit back, relax, grab a pint, and enjoy the show. You've seen the future and it works today. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Draft Mechanic. I'm Jake. And I'm Danielle. And Draft Mechanic is the podcast about board games and craft beer and anything we can do to tie the two together. Here at Draft Mechanic, we like our beer like we like our board games. Not hot. Not hot. No, it's, neither your board games nor your beer should be uh, hot. It is the middle of summer, and like I wanted to come up with a really good like this time, but all I can think about is how dang hot and humid it is here in the southeast. Well, frankly, and, I'm glad that neither <laughs> our beer nor our board games are watered down at the moment, oh, because geez. we had some uh, some water issues in our house, and for all the cardboard that is in this house, <laughs> it all managed to stay dry, so oh, I am thankful for that. That is an absolute miracle, but hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Draft Mechanic. We are obviously the Board Games and Craft Beer Podcast. If you want more information, you can go to draftmechanic.net. It's your one-stop shop for all your draft mechanic needs at Draft Mechanic. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the usual places are those. We also have a Board Game Geek Guild. That is guild number 2470. There will be a thread up there for this episode as there is for every episode. So if we're saying something and you have an opinion on what we're talking about, that is a place to leave it. There will also be an additional poll up there that I'm going to put up for some future beer segments that will be on our Twitter, in our Board Game Geek Guild, and on our slack so keep an eye out for that in the coming minutes because it'll be up before this episode goes up Ooh, coming minutes that's now even it i mean it will be now (laughs) then but not now i have a hard time dealing with time if you happen to be in the charlotte north carolina area we do twice monthly meetups and our next one is going to be on tuesday july 16th at salute cerveceria Mm. that will be tuesday july 16th then yeah Also now, I guess. I guess at any time it'll be Tuesday, July 16th. We also do meetups on the first Thursday of every month, but that won't happen until August. Actually, I think we will not be doing one in August because we will be at Gen Con. (laughs) We are learning on the fly at the beginning of this particular episode, and I'm loving it. Yeah, Gen Con. It is kind of crazy that it is sneaking up on us so fast. And by sneaking up, I mean it's been a constant thing just around the corner for the last eight months. Okay, we're not going to complain about Gen Con again at the beginning of this episode. I feel not like this, gonna is becoming, do it. this is becoming a trope. <laughs> uh, the Gen Con Geek Preview on BoardGameGeek.com uh, is up to 464 titles right now with three weeks to go. Place your bets. How many is it going to get to when we do our Hype List episode, the, uh, I guess three weeks from when you're listening to this today? Uh, I thought we already did this. 700? I'm going to say 650. You think 650? All right. I'll go over on 650. Okay. The other kind of interesting Board Game Geek related convention news, they are partnering with Fun Again Games this year to kind of revive Fun Again Games' Essen Mule service. This is a uh, service that Fun Again Games used to provide back when they really had their online storefront rolling, where they would partner with publishers at Essen to purchase the games and then bring them back over here to kind of make these things more available to people over in the U.S. And this year, Board Game Geek announced that they're going to be calling it Cardboard Caravan, and it's all going to be purchasable through BGG's Geek Preview this year of whichever publishers choose to become a part of it. I really like this idea, and I'm glad that it's coming back around again. Yeah, and I also like the fact that they're integrating it with the Geek Preview, since that is such a functional tool already. Mm-hmm. It's the kind of thing where if you're interested in what's coming out at the convention, you have it all sort of in one spot. You see what's coming out, and you can preview it and order it through there. I also like that they renamed it, because that name was always a little kind of... <laughs> I was not a fan but now we have Cardboard Caravan and you'll be able to get all of your cool new Euros that are coming out because we cannot wait. Oh yeah, thematic Euros. It's the jam. <laughs> hey, maybe Board and Dice will put their stuff up there and we can get Escape Tales Low Memory and you, dear listener, can also get Escape Tales Low Memory, which will apparently be premiering at Essen this year. Nice. I'm excited for Escape Tales, Just literally all the time. Hey, reel it in. <laughs> all right. Danielle, let's move on to some Kickstarter stuff. You got the updates for us? I do. 
Remarkable Shops and Their Wares from Lore Smith has finished its campaign with $114,861 of its $16,847 goal with 3,185 backers. Mm -hmm. They plan to create a special backer exclusive shop that focuses on pets and mounts. And that will get access through digital download, which is super fun. It's nice to have a uh, fun little thing that you get for having backed their campaign. Mm -hmm. And everybody likes a pet shop, right? Oh, yeah. And I did end up backing this one. I got the paperback versions of the books. So I'm kind of excited to just kind of have those and peruse through them and take a look at them. And now we'll have this extra shop to kind of poke at if we ever decide to make a campaign of some kind. Very nice. The Refuge Terror from the Deep from B&B Games has funded with $106,945 of their $14,000 goal. So Just that is barely slipped by. No, I think that that's pretty <laughs> safe passing. With 1,457 backers, they hit 24 stretch goals, and that unlocked new components, content, and an expanded art book. Pre-orders for this are still available if you missed out. Finally, Darwinauts from Green Couch Games that we talked about in the last episode is funding at $25,265 of their $18,000 goal. So that is a little bit closer, but they are still rolling. And they've got 565 backers. This is ending on Sunday, July 14th. And it looks like they'll be announcing a solo mode on July 10th. So the stretch goals so far include some fun custom meeples, and the next one coming soon would be promo terrain tiles if they meet that. I'm actually kind of interested in this. So they didn't officially announce a solo mode, but they said come back on July 10th for an announcement that will appeal to people who like solo games. So you kind of guess what that's probably going to be. And the promo I don't know how you made that leap. <laughs> the promo terrain tiles are actually really interesting. So when we played this, each of the terrain tiles is split diagonally into two sections of two different types of terrain. The promo terrain tiles, there's a few wild terrains. Mm -hmm. And then there's also some that are split into three different shapes, which is kind of an interesting idea, Dag. having played that game, how that's going to kind of manipulate stuff. So maybe like one goes kind of bridges across from left side to right side, while the other ones are like the top and the bottom. Or there's one that's, you know, you know, these two sides are connected, but the other two aren't connected to each other. So really cool stuff. I'm super excited about Darwinauts, and I think this is going to be a really fun game. Okay, why don't you tell us about some new projects, though? All right, so in new projects, I've got four items for you, two of which are games, one of which is a accessory, and one of which is adorable. And I'm going to start with the adorable, because Tiny Dice Buddies is back yet again. Nice. I so mean, we, we are big fans of Tiny <laughs> Dice Buddies around here. The new campaign from Double Feature is Classy Dice Buddies Part 1, and this is currently funding at $609 of the $517 goal with 24 backers. This one ends on Saturday, July 27th with an estimated delivery of September. It's roughly 10 bucks a pin, but if you have higher levels, you get some discounts to so like five pins. It knocks it down like 45 bucks for the set or something. So what this is is the Tiny Dice Buddies set of design in RPG classes. Currently, there are pins for the Wizard and Druid classes, but more people that get in here are going to unlock more styles, which means we have the opportunity to get to the Bard, the Paladin, the Fighter, and the Ranger. They are all super cute, which is not a surprise if you've heard us talk about Tiny Dice Buddies before. They're awesome, and you should get on them because they're great, and Laura's pins are awesome. Obviously, she made our draft mechanic pin, so I'm a little biased. A little bit. Yes. So yeah, Classy Dice Buddies, go check it out. Super cool stuff. The other one I have is one that I actually did not expect to bring up on here at any point because I've never really been in on the board game bag thing, but I'm going to be talking about the board game bag and calendar from BoardGameTables.com. See, that's what I thought, that you were not in on this board game bag thing, and then you went to Origins and you came back with <laughs> all these board game bags. I may have come back with two bags. What anyway, has happened? So this one is currently funding at $157,000 of the $1,000 goal with a little over 3,100 backers. And this is ending on Friday, July 19th, with an estimated delivery of September this year. The standard bag is $29, and they also have a heavy-duty one that is $44. The calendar is $13, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But basically, you have a version 2 of the BoardGameTables.com bag. I, Like you said, I picked up two of these at Origins kind of on a whim. They had them for, like, fire sale for 20 bucks a piece. And what it is is a large bag that fits your 12 by 12 board game boxes, and it has, you know, shoulder straps so you can backpack. It. It's got a nice reinforced handle on the top. And I just like, I saw them all around and I said, okay, well, we're always using these tote bags and they're fine. They're good. And sometimes we use a duffel bag and it's fine and it's good. But I saw, you know, I had a chance to actually have hands on time with some of these because everybody else that I was staying with at Origins picked up two or three of them. And I was looking at them like, wow, this thing is actually pretty dang good quality. So I picked up two and we've been using them for our board game nights at Salud and 
a good road for the last few weeks, and they do honestly make it really easy to pack and move games, at least my, from my perspective, and I'm surprised how comfortable they are when you put them on your shoulders. I did not expect them to be as comfortable as they are. I don't know why. Perhaps a greater disagree on the comfort, but they are very functional. Yeah, and it has a nice little front pocket as well. That's where I throw like the welcome to pads, the extra pads and stuff that we have. We gotta actually talk about those soon. That'll be fun. Yeah, well. Oh yeah. Anyway, uh, the things that have changed about this version of the bag, they added a shoulder strap so you can kind of carry it like a duffel bag. And instead of it being kind of the thing where it folds down kind of like a, a drawbridge, it actually folds to this, opens to the side. Like a refrigerator? So, yeah, like a refrigerator, exactly. So if you lay it down, if you lay it down flat uh, long ways on the back, it'll flip up like a, a normal duffel bag would. And I actually kind of like that. Um, I like the way ours are, and you know, I don't need more bags. But like, if you don't have one of these bags, I gotta say, it's actually a pretty dang good bag. And at 29 bucks, that's a pretty decent deal there. Compared to some of the other board game carrying oh, bags yeah. that have been on Kickstarter recently, yeah, it is an excellent deal. And I feel like that's sort of comparable to the the drum bags that were going around mm-hmm. that people were buying off Amazon. Yeah. But I do know that a couple of people who have bought those off Amazon have had a little bit of trouble with durability, especially on the straps on those. So this is probably a far better option. Yeah, and the other thing is that heavy-duty version that I was talking about has a different color. It's like a like a metallic blue or something, and it is reinforced for a heavier weight capacity, which is nice, I guess, if you have giant games with a lot of wooden inserts. Like, I'm not putting Scythe and Star Trek Ascendancy in my current board game tables bags, but maybe this reinforced one would be a smarter place for me to carry those kind of things if I wanted to. The other part of this is the board game calendar, which is actually... Interesting. I I expected it to just be your typical 12-month calendar, but it's actually a weekly calendar. So it's a smaller weekly calendar with 53 weeks in it, and each of them features different photos from the board game community. And one thing that they are very clear about on the Kickstarter page is that all of the people whose photos will be used will be receiving percentage royalty from it as well, because it's not like it's just their in-house team. They're actually working with a lot of people from BoardGameGeek to put their, uh, their work into this calendar. Now, why is there an extra week? 53 weeks. I mean, in case it doesn't come even on the beginning or end of the year. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just, just yeah. I curious. think like the, the first one probably has like December 30th or something. And the last one probably has a little bit of January. Okay. But yeah, that's works a, for me. It's a pretty neat little calendar. And you know, you can get combinations of anything you want there. They have like 12 packs of the bags or something. If you really want to move everything all at the same time, all the time. Like, I don't know if you've got like a, a games library, like I could th- see Mark Kale for Mega MooseCon needing bags like this to move games in and out for huh. their library, something like that. If you have a local con you're getting together. I would imagine it also is meant for people who have like a whole group and uh, several people mm-hmm. want to order them. Also, not like also one person who needs 12. <laughs> no, I'm just going to strap 12 bags to myself. Just mm-hmm. chain them. Up. Good luck. <laughs> All right. Well, that is the board game bag and calendar for board game tables, and they are available through Friday, July 19th. Can we talk about the next one now, please? Cats. Danielle, are you a fan of cats? I love cats. <laughs> so next up, we have The Isle of Cats that is being published by The City of Games, currently funding at 252000 of the $19,000 goal with 3,500 backers. This one ends Thursday, July 25th, with an estimated delivery of March 2020. So lots of people love cats. Oh, yeah. $63 to back the game, and then $88 adds in the five and six player expansion. And basically, The Isle of Cats is a polyomino game where your polyominoes are cats. You are happy now. Over the five game rounds, you were going to be saving cats from the Isle of Cats before the evil pirate Vash arrives. I don't know what happens when he gets there. Maybe he pets all the cats and nobody else can pet cats then. I don't know. I'm trying to make like a polydactyl polyominoes joke and it's not working. So if anybody can come up with the good one of those, please let me know. So each round of the game, you're going to be drafting and buying these special cards with fish because you go fishing at the beginning of every round. And then you're going to use those cards that have powers and scoring conditions to do a bunch of stuff. You basically are getting cats off the island. You're putting them onto your boat. You want to place cats of the same family next to each other so they're all happy and stuff. You're also getting the cats to cover up rats and you want them to fill all the rooms because you want as many cats as possible on your boat. That tracks. Yeah. And then there's a whole bunch of different scoring conditions depending on where your cats are, what they're covering, what cards you've drawn. So there's like a ton of variability in the scoring in this game, which is kind of interesting. Hmm. Uh, I got a chance to look at this, but not actually take a play of it at Origins. The designer Frank just had it out and some of our friends had a chance to sign up for a play test or, a, you know, like a little demo session. And I wandered by at the end. I'm like... You have cats and polyominoes, sir. I'm going to need to know more about this game. Did they enjoy it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
but it friends, looks, not the cats. Oh, the cats also. Yeah, they're, Though, I, they're it, made of cardboard. It seems it seems like a lot of fun, and I'm kind of bummed that I didn't have time to sit down and take a play of it because it seems exactly up my alley. Drafting, polyominoes, cats. Nice. Yes, those things. So yeah, the Isle of Cats. This is pretty much a guaranteed thing that if you like polyominoes and cats, you probably want to take a look at this Kickstarter because we took a look at this Kickstarter for sure. <laughs> So lastly, in our Kickstarter section, we have the Always Green Garden from Splattered Ink Games. This one is currently on its way to funding at $32.88 of its $8,000 goal with 99 backers. It ends on Friday, July 26th with an estimated delivery of March 2020. You can get the game for $26 and $38 allows you to get the deluxe edition with these deluxe wooden ingredient tokens. Very nice little tokens of mushrooms and wheats and things like that. Vegetables and berries are the other two things. <laughs> yes. So, uh, and also wood. Wood is also an ingredient. Of course it is. So, in the Always Green Garden, you are moving your gnome chef around the said garden to harvest ingredients and work with the forest gardeners to complete delicious recipes. Each turn of the game, you're going to start out by rolling the ingredient dice that are going to grow ingredients in some of the four sections of the garden. You're then going to do a worker placement thingy where you move your gnome chef to one of those four regions and then take a number of actions. You can harvest ingredients there. You can spend and wood to work with Ollie the elephant on his special tools that allow you to manipulate the dice and cards and ingredients in fun ways. And you can also work with the four different gardeners, one for each of the different regions of the board, to manipulate your stuff in more interesting ways. Also draw more recipe cards and more action cards to give you even more tools to play around with as you're coming up with more and more interesting ways to get stuff into your personal collection. You're going about collecting the different resources with the goal of finishing recipes that you're going to then present to one of the four gardeners. You have to be in the position of one of the gardeners to present their particular kind of recipe. And once you do, that scores you points, but it also unlocks a special die for that particular gardener. Those dice are going to grow ingredients in interesting ways or give you other ways to get bigger and better payouts. So as you go on through the game, you're going to get more and more options available to you to get those bigger recipes. The game will continue on until somebody's completed four recipes and then everybody's going to get two more turns in order to hopefully get a few more recipes or draw some more cards or get some more ingredients in there for whatever their secret scoring objectives are. At the end of the game, whoever's got the most points, I guess, is the best chef? Yeah, the best chef in the Always Green Garden. So we had a chance to actually play this. We got a preview copy of it from Splattered Ink Games, which is Daryl Jones, who is both the designer and the artist. Daryl also did the art for Into the Black Forest from Green Couch Games and Freshwater Fly from Bellwether Games that we've talked about in the past. So you've got this really realistic yet whimsical style for a lot of the art in this you have the uh, the owl with the top hat and we've talked about obviously the crazy frog in uh into the black forest was another one his art's really good and i just love the style that it brings into this game it definitely enhances the feel of everything i did very much enjoy the squirrel with a little shoulder <laughs> shawl and a little teacup and i think the fact that this game had such a fun artwork style to it did help it along because it made you feel like you were engaging in a sort of a fun resource collection as opposed to just trying to get, you know, I need the green cube, I need the yellow cube, you know, just to try and make whatever I'm making. It, the theme really did bring out something nice. We were both laughing that you can make sandwiches in this game, spelled <laughs> S-A-M-M-I-C-H. I'm like, yeah, that's funny. You can make a stew. I can add butter to something and that makes it better. The theme is really a benefit to this game and I like it a lot. I definitely felt myself learning more and more interesting ways to do things as the turns went on. You know, the very beginning of the game, obviously, you're just collecting one or two resources. But as you start getting some of that wood and you start getting access to the other dice by completing recipes, you start to have these kind of synergistic turns where maybe I'm going to hop over here, grab three resources that allow me to complete this recipe. And then at the same time, I'm also using this special card out of my hand that allows me to move all of the gardeners in a special way and do some stuff like that. Obviously, it's going to be determined on what kind of cards you're able to get into your hands because these special power cards, there's a decently sized deck of them, and some of them are going to be more useful in some circumstances than others. Certainly, some of the special power cards will upgrade recipes that you've already completed, which is useful if you've already done a good number of recipes, but this game does only go until somebody has completed four recipes and then there's two more turns to sort of wrap up what you're working on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you've already completed two or three recipes, having those upgrades can be really useful. Like I said, you can add butter to something and that gives you an extra point for having it. As long as it is of the correct type. You, I guess, don't want to add butter to certain ty types of dishes. <laughs> but there are also 
upgrade cards that give you additional actions. And if you've got a handful of those, that can be significantly more valuable than just one point, Mm -hmm. just because it can really move your turn along. Even though you have the ability to take multiple actions on a turn, you can harvest and use the power of the gardener at the location you are at, or harvest and turn in a recipe, and you have to move on every turn. Even though you're doing a couple of different things, having those power cards that give you even more actions, I feel like is significantly more powerful than just having an extra point or two on a recipe that you've already created. And one thing I will say, you know, we always talk about games like the Manhattan Project problem of if you fall one cycle behind on, you know, building whatever point scoring thing that you don't really get yourself competitive. The point scoring levels in this one for the recipes were kind of between, I think, two and seven or so is kind of the spread I saw. Yeah. Making it that those upgrades actually felt useful. Like there were I think, so you had like one or two really high scoring things and I actually finished the game with four recipes, but some of them were two pointers. And had I not upgraded my stuff, I actually would have, you know, finished the game, but still lost to your much more valuable recipes. Yeah, but I spent a lot of time collecting the ingredients for those recipes, which is why I only had two of them. Mm -hmm. And it did feel a little bit like in the middle of the game, like I wasn't actually getting anything done because I was spending (laughs) a lot of time getting the the ingredients for those recipes but in the end of it we were less than i think we were like two points apart Mm -hmm. at the end of the game so it was worth it it just like i wasn't moving the cards as much Mm -hmm. another thing i will say i could understand that if you have a tendency to overanalyze you could probably spend way too much time thinking about your turn especially once you get a number of cards into your hand so this is obviously going to be something you want to watch that if you are taking too long to let yourself just move on and grab some berries (laughs) <laughs> well, because there are so many different options of when you can take actions that the combinations sort of vary. If I use wood, which is not a food ingredient, obviously, thankfully, but it is something that you can give to Ollie the elephant to use one of the special powers. If you've heard our description of freshwater fly, where you have sort of those power tiles that allow you to take mm-hmm. a one-time action and then flip over to another option, they're very similar to those. So if you if you want to have a wood cube that you're going to use to use one of those actions, it may shift the gardeners or it may allow you to place out more cubes or draw additional cards, which may change the things that you're going to do later in the turn. It may allow you to move a second time on your turn, which is not something you would normally be able to do. Or you can take some of your other actions at the location you're already at and then take your mandatory move after you've done some harvesting or working with one of the gardeners. You need to really determine when you're going to take each of your actions, and if you take them at a different time, will they produce a different result? So for a game that looks fairly simple when you set it up, it's only like four little garden tiles and the elephant thing and then two stacks of cards, it really can be uh, almost like overwhelming with how many choices you have on your specific turn and you have to be careful because if you don't make the most of your turn there's likely not going to be a lot of ingredients left by the time you get to your next turn even in a two-player game we found stuff was getting cleared off the board fairly quickly especially since some of those gardener powers allow you to take from adjacent gardens than the one that you're standing in or allow you to steal from other players. So you really need to make sure that you're getting what you need and you're not leaving options available for other players. Yeah, I really dig the decisions that I had in this game, you know, just trying to decide, especially in the mid to late game as I'm trying to decide how to be most efficient with my recipes. Hopefully I can get some four or five point recipe cards in there rather than just another two point recipe because I really need to get that one more point or two out of each of those turns. One of the things that was a little bit frustrating was the level of randomness in this game. Since the ingredients that come out on each turn are determined by die rolls, you are never really guaranteed a specific type of recipe. Now, there is a little bit of mitigation there. There is a wild side on, I believe all of the dice have at least one wild symbol on them. Mm -hmm. And there are different distributions of the dice that are available to you. So if you've already completed a yellow recipe, that means that you can roll the yellow die, and that is more geared towards the wheat and nuts recipes, which is the yellow recipes. Or if you've completed a green recipe, there are, you can have the green die, which is more geared towards vegetables. And you can decide whether you roll the initial dice, which are fairly balanced, or if you roll one of the specialized dice, as one of your two dice that you're rolling. So you do have a little bit of mitigation in the distribution there, but it's also entirely possible that you just roll two clouds and you don't Mm -hmm. get to place out any recipes. 
the same is said for the decks of cards. There is a real ease about getting more cards and cycling through cards because the powers of the gardeners allow you to draw cards so freely and discard cards so you're not exceeding your max hand size. But at the same time, the special power that I had chosen at the beginning of the game wanted me to get green recipe cards. And even though I was cycling through recipe cards fairly frequently, I just wasn't drawing them. I was drawing a lot of black and yellow recipe cards, which were higher point values, like you had said, but they weren't really helpful towards my end goal. So it was something I had to decide whether or not I was going to even go towards that end goal. And I was hoping that you weren't going to be able to go towards yours very strongly, (laughs) which you only, I think, got one instance of it instead of, you know, multiple instances of it, which would have been difficult. But mine said, like, have three green recipes. I didn't have three recipes at all at the end of the game. (laughs) Yeah, I was able to make one set of three, but I didn't have any stews. Oh, I I did like the fact also some of the upgrade cards that allow you to quote unquote change the type of a recipe. Like there's a pan that allows you to change anything into a loaf. And I just find that hilarious that like I've got this sandwich, but it's a loaf now because I put it in a pan. I had chunky (laughs) gravy that allows anything to become a stew because if you stuff enough (laughs) chunky gravy on top of it, it's a stew now, I guess. But to get back to the point, like there is certainly still some randomness in this game. You're never going to be able to exactly plan what you're going to do on your turn because there is always going to be the die roll that's going to determine your ingredients and the randomness of the draws in a fairly decently sized deck for this game. Yeah, I would say there's some interesting decisions, there's some fun gameplay, some interesting synergy, and it's enhanced by this whimsical kind of fun theme. And I just, you know, it makes me feel all fun about that because then I look at the, at the elephant up there. And he's all just like, hey, give me your woods and I'll move your dice for you. That's just weird. Yeah, that's our soundbite. You can quote me on that. The the, the elephant just wants some wood to move your dice around. (laughs) All right. So that is the Always Green Garden. (laughs) It is on Kickstarter now. And you can check it out until Friday, July 26th. Of course, Danielle, you'll be putting links to this and all other Kickstarter items in the show notes. That's what I do. You can find them at boardgames.beer slash show dash notes or draftmechanic.net. If you don't want to remember that boardgames.beer is an actual website that I bought. (laughs) Oh. Danielle, I'm having a good old time. Should we move on to some recent plays? We should. Let's do that. Want to wear your draft mechanic pride to your local brewery, board game meetup, or board game meetup at a brewery? Check out redbubble.com slash people slash draft mechanic for t-shirts. So first up, we got to play Shikoku, which is a 2019 release in the U.S. from Grand Gamers Guild. This plays three to eight players in 30 to 45 minutes. It is designed by Eloy Pujadas, and the artist is Amelia Salas. This is a race to the middle game of action programming and stair mastering. So we did get Shikoku as a review copy from Grand Gamers Guild, so thanks to them for passing this one my way. I actually had a chance to look at this briefly at Origins, and the demoer pretty much sold me on it in seconds, and then I'm obviously talking to Mark, and he's like, here you go, talk about it on the show. I'm like, well, I was going to anyway, but sir, if you insist, let's talk about Shikoku. Yeah, lots. So in the game of Shikoku, you and the other players are playing the role of pilgrims who are climbing the 33 steps of the Yakuoshi Temple on Shikoku Island, one of the four main islands of Japan, and on your journey you are seeking the middle path. So this is kind of a race game disguised as not racing in a way, because your goal is to not be the first to the top of the temple or be the last person on the temple steps, but be either the second from the top or the second from the bottom. So at the end of the game, you're going to have generally two or more winners, depending on who is the second from the top and the second from the bottom of the cluster of people that are moving up the steps here. So the central board has steps 1 to 33, and you're also going to have a deck of cards also numbered 1 to 33, and each of the cards is going to have a number of sandals at the bottom between 1 and 6 sandals. It's kind of distributed out so that it's balanced in a way that the furthest of the bottom and furthest of the highest don't have a whole lot of sandals, but also some of the middle do, and it's not random, but I haven't figured out the pattern yet, I guess is the best way to say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably in a balanced way. (laughs) And the game is going to continue until somebody reaches the very top step, at which point we'll evaluate who's on the second from the top and second from the bottom step of all those spaces. And then whoever that is is going to be the winners and they will feel very enlightened or something like that. For sure. You'll start the game out by dealing the number of cards for the number of players and then randomly distributing meeples onto that. And then everybody is going to move up their meeple on the main board that number of steps. So you'll kind of have a, a starting position between one and six steps. And so you at least have something to work with. 
You slide those cards up, and then whoever's at the front of that line in the, the card line is going to choose a card out of their hand, which they start with three, to place down in front of them and move their little um, signifier meeple onto that, next player, so on and so forth. And as people play those cards, they're going to be arranging them in numerical order. The important part here is, once all of those cards have been played out, that's the new turn order. And whoever is the second from the bottom and second from the top in that line of cards is not going to move their meeple on that turn of the game. Everybody else will, however, move their way up. So if you're later in turn order when you play your card, you're going to have more information, and you can basically kind of choose whether or not you're going to move that round, depending on, obviously, the cards that you have. After you've done all of that moving and shaking up the temple steps, you're going to move whichever card is in the very front to the very back of the turn order line, and then players are going to draft out of the previously vacated line cards back into their hand. Whoever moved to the end position, by the way, if there's any more cards in the draw deck that started the game, they'll draw one in and then a card will go out. So you do get a little bit of kind of changing of the cards as you go on, especially in higher player count games. But as you get to the later rounds in those higher player count games, you're going to know exactly where all of the cards are if you can remember which cards people took into their hands. So you won't remember. (laughs) So the game will continue, like I said, until somebody reaches the very top step of the pagoda and then that player will we'll lose will lose <laughs> but the players or the player or players right below them will feel very good about themselves because they have determined the right place to be same with the people who are second from the bottom they just did it a little slower i guess but yeah um this is a game that plays exactly like that and i don't know why i said that <laughs> oh danielle please save me <laughs> Okay, I mean, this was a very fun game, because at the beginning, it seemed kind of like you were just taking cards and moving at random. You knew that you wanted to move up on the stairs, but you knew you didn't want to be moving the most. But at the beginning, it doesn't really matter, and it gives you a minute to get used to the way the mechanic works, to understand that if you play close to the beginning of the number set, a very low number, you're likely going to be in that second position. Maybe you play a five or a six. You're like, okay, somebody probably has a number slightly lower than that. And maybe they want to move. So if you play the the one, you're guaranteed to move because nobody can play ahead of you. And if you same play the 33, you're guaranteed to move. But if you play a number just sort of around that, you're probably not going to, to move. Or if you play a number in the middle, you may think that you are absolutely going to move. And then everybody plays numbers lower than it. And you're like, oh, (laughs) well, maybe I won't. Maybe somebody's going to play one higher. There's half the numbers are higher. What am I going to do now? And you sort of second guess it. But by the time you get about halfway up the stairs, you get a feel for how the movement works and how the distribution of cards are. Some of the cards have been removed from the game because in those early rounds, you are taking a card out every turn when you hand the person who was the first in numerical order their new card from the draw deck. In a five-player count game, even with several rounds, we did not run out of cards, but in an eight-player count game, we definitely did. So you see cards coming out and you know that, okay, the 29 is no longer in this distribution. Oh, shoot, neither is the 31 anymore. So now we're sort of shifting expectations as to what is a high card, or if, if low cards had been removed, what was a low card. And you adjust to that. And by the time you get up to maybe, I want to say, like the last 10 steps, Mm -hmm. everybody is trying to jockey for position, whether it's to move ahead or because they are in the middle of the pack and they're trying desperately to be that second person from the top or to lag behind. Maybe they don't want to move because they're sort of towards the back of the middle. And you're like, okay, I'm not going to get all the way up to the front of the pack or second from the front of the pack, but maybe I can lag behind enough that there'll only be one person behind me. But then I got to really make sure that that person doesn't move when I place my card down. So I'm going to want to be at the end of the turn order so I can really control their movement. It really leads to an interesting puzzle and one where you and the other players are really having a fun time trying to see who can snipe the other person on movement, make them move when they don't want to move, make them not move when they really want to move forward. It's not long enough that it feels really frustrating when that happens to you. And the interaction is in, I understand it's supposed to be like a, I guess kind of a somber theme because you're you're supposed to be avoiding this horrible year of luck that you, you will have because of your age. But every time we played it, we had a great time. We were laughing by the end of it, just trying to like crowd in at the end and maybe hang back just one more step. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not this turn. Maybe, maybe I don't want to move at all. 
I think what was most surprising to me is I expected this game to have a king-making problem at the end, and because you only have three cards in your hand, you really are limited in the options that you have to really make that play that forces somebody into winning or forces somebody into losing. Obviously, whoever's playing the very last card of the game is going to have some effect, but I really felt in all the games we played that any time it came down to that point, the... It had already been kind of been decided how it was going to shake out, and it really just came down to whether or not somebody was going to be tied with or not tied with for one of those scoring steps. Well, and, even towards yep. the end of the game, though, like I was trying to make sure that my Mebo was in the position I wanted it to be in. I didn't really have time to worry about what you were doing, especially <laughs> in a higher player count game, where I'm like, okay, there are three Meeples, and if all of them move, I have a problem. So how can I play the number so that one of them doesn't move, but I still move enough. Mm -hmm. And, I, okay, I see they. This, this other player has put down a card, which is sort of in the middle, so they're likely going to move. So I can't count on them being the one that doesn't move. I spent so much time towards the even, especially at the end of the game, because it is so crucial at the end of the game, worrying about my own strategy. I wasn't sitting there going, well, do I want Jake to win or do I want Mitch to win? <laughs> The other part of that is that it also, I was really surprised how tight it always is at the end of the game, especially in that eight player game we played. We were super spread out. I think we had somebody jumped like maybe seven or eight steps ahead of everybody else at one point. But it's still like when we finished the game, we were all in the top six steps and it was really, really tight at the end. And just I got to say, it's it's really a, um, a credit to the balance of the deck itself that they've paced it out so that people are going to generally end up near each other by the end of the game. We never had a blowout in any way. Which is good because you don't you don't want to blow out, but <laughs> I also think that towards the end of the game people were just playing cards that were of a low movement value, assuming that they were okay, if I move, I'm probably gonna move because <laughs> it was a high enough player count game that two players were not moving and six players were. So I'm likely gonna move. Well, if I move, I want to make sure I only move one. Mm -hmm. I'll worry next round about whether or not I can get myself into position. I want to make sure I don't end the game now, because if I end the game, I'm definitely going to lose. So <laughs> the players that were in the front just started playing really low movement cards, and that tightened up the pack and made that end more exciting. Yeah. So the natural way that you have to play in order to not just immediately end the game makes the end of it tense. No, I really dig it. It reminded me a lot of Gravwell but except obviously higher player count and quicker turnaround on the rounds. And I always have really liked Gravwell. You know, we played that a lot in the past and it comes up every now and then as well, but it has that same kind of programming where we're all trying to move, but the movement is so dependent on what other players do. But I really just like, I enjoy the way that everybody is in turn order laying down their cards because every single card play, you get somebody at the table goes, oh no, and you get that kind of fun reaction. So the more in a programming game that I'm able to get those, oh man, my plans got totally ruined, or whoa, I didn't expect that to work out. The more I get those reactions, the more fun I have with a programming game. And I feel like Shikoku had a whole ton of that. Yeah, I mean, the problem that we've had every time with Gravel is that it only plays four, and mm -hmm. it's the kind of game where you want a bunch of people to be able to get in, because that allows you to sort of slingshot off the other players in fun ways, but it only plays up to four. Where here, you can get a whole bunch of folks in there and everybody can get in on the fun. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed this and I'm glad that you brought it back. Yeah, this one is the kind of game that stays in our game night bag for a long time. Again, because of the high player count, the ease of instru or the ease of teaching people, and also the play time. That 30 to 45 minutes is not a joke. We played it twice at our game night this week. Yeah, 45 seems like a lot. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is available at conventions from Grand Gamers Guild, and it's going to be hopefully available online soon as well, so hopefully you can see that soon. I super encourage people with bigger groups to check out Shikoku. I had a lot of fun with it. You seem to have had a lot of fun with it as well. I did. I would not be surprised if we talk about this one again at our end of the year wrap up for 2019. Well, let's not get so ahead of ourselves. No, we we got to redux our 2018 <laughs> this episode first. Well, before we do that, how about we go way back in the time, all the way to the year 2010, for a game called Navigador from P.D. Verlag. Plays two to five players in 60 to 90 minutes. That was such a smooth segue. Good mm. job, us. Designed by Mac... Gertz, who is also the designer of Concordia, and art by Marina Farenbach and Mac Gertz. This is a game of strategic sailing, goods economizing, and a healthy dose of rondelization. So in Navigador, you are a member of the Portuguese sailing fleet, I suppose, and it is the age of discovery, and you are trying to trek your way from Portugal all the way to Japan, hopefully. And you are going to be 
establishing colonies and having trade and discovering new regions of the map because this is the things that Europeans think that they did during the Age of Discovery. Um, <laughs> you are also going to be using, like you said, a rondelle to be able to choose the actions that you have on your turn. Rondelectable. Indeed. On your turn, you're going to be at a specific position on this rondelle, and you're going to be able to move your pawn one to three spaces forward, giving you essentially three options on your turn. These are going to be types of actions like recruiting more workers into your fleet or producing more ships that you can use to sail around and discover, hear them air quotes, things. You can establish colonies, which are going to give you access to some of the resources that you can use when you go to the market space, which is on the rondelle actually twice, which is great because that's how you get money for most of the game. If you go to the market, you are going to be able to either sell goods from your colonies which is going to use one scale and move the price in one direction, or you're going to be able to process goods at your factories, which you built using one of the other rondelle actions, which is building. The buildings that are available to you are factories that run the three types of goods that you are using from the colonies. Like I said, those are sugar, gold, and uh, I believe it's spice. Or you can build shipbuilding wharfs or cathedrals which are going to help you produce more ships or more workers when you take those actions the final thing that you can do on your turn is you can exercise privilege oh god which will make <laughs> i mean i didn't name it yeah i know uh, which will make one of your scoring columns more valuable to you because the scoring at the end of the game is going to be variable at the beginning of the game, everybody is going to get the same score for each of their colonies, their buildings, their exploration tokens, their shipbuilding lots, and their cathedrals at the end of the game. But if you go to the privilege space, you are going to remove one of your workers from the game. Don't worry, you can hire them back later when you go to the worker space. But you will then be able to add an extra point token to one of your spaces, making that thing worth more at the end of the game. So you are able to customize how you score at the end of the game. And the scoring is going to be for each individual instance of that item. So say I'm increasing my scoring on shipbuilding, which is what I did when we played this game. I also then built a whole bunch of things that allowed me to build ships, which gave me points for getting my ships on the boards. Ships and workers are each worth a point at the end of the game. But it also meant that every one of those was going to give me a whole boatload of points because I had really racked up how much that was. That really means that this game has a lot of variability to the scoring at the end of it. But we'll get to that when we talk about how the game plays. You're going to keep moving around this rondelle, taking turns and taking in exploration and building and colonizing and trading back and forth until either all of the buildings on the board have been built. That means all the different factories and cathedrals and shipbuilding ports have been built onto people's boards, or somebody reaches Nagasaki, which is the farthest point from Portugal on the map. At that point, everybody's going to get another turn to, you know, to finish up your Euro business that you're doing. And then you will score based on your individual customized scoring point distribution that you have from all of the privilege and things that you've built. Whoever has the most points, unsurprisingly, is the winner because this is a game. Oh, most points. Yeah, most points. I, until this moment, thought that I won that game of Navigador because I had the least points. Well, we, it was a Euro that we played with somebody who had played it before, so neither of us Yo, won that played, game. If you played a Euro before, you're going to whoop me, pretty much. No, um, there was a lot of really interesting ideas in this that, honestly, when setting it down on the table, I look at it and was like, I don't really see how these things are going to be interesting together. But there was a lot of really interesting synergy in terms of the way that you have to grow your workers so that you can then use your workers to make colonies. you got to grow your boats so you can get more boats so you can actually get exploration tokens out the furthest, which is the route that I took. May not be the best route in the future for other players, but it was fun for me. I got to have a, a lot of boats, and I had a whole bunch of little discs that I stacked up. No, I mean, it really was interesting. I agree. It did not look interesting when we put it on the table. It, it is a beige map, which had a lot of little tokens on it with symbols that were functional, but not exciting. Thematic euros. There was an economy section to the board in the upper left that <laughs> had some numbers, sure did have some numbers and tracks. And then there was a nice little rondelle in the bottom and there was a section for some buildings. And I'm looking at this, I'm like, this is going to be dry. 
But it was really interesting. I liked the fact that you could make your game function ideally however you want it. Like you could maximize your points on cathedrals if you wanted to Mm -hmm. make sure that you had a lot of workers and workers were helpful for building buildings because you needed to have a certain number of build of workers to build a building. Like I guess you send those guys and they go off and they build that building and building cathedrals takes a lot of workers. So if you are going that route, it sort of spirals into being able to help you down that route. You have to get rid of a guy to gain the privilege to increase the scoring on your cathedrals but you had cheaper workers every time you hired because you had all those cathedrals. Mm-hmm. You could focus only. You could focus mostly on exploring, which is what you were doing. It, I just don't think you got quite enough of those points tokens to make sure that <laughs> the six explore tokens you had at the end of the game were worth more than they originally were to you. I think you only had them at like four or five points, whereas yeah. if you had gotten those up to maybe six or seven points at the end of the game, you would have been right in it. I mean, you and I and Mark were all relatively close. Michael, who owns this game and taught this game, and thank you for teaching us this game, because it was really interesting, (laughs) blew us all out of the water, but he knew what he was doing, and that's how a Euro should work. Like, you should have knowledge and be able to grow on that. Knowledge is power. The other cool thing about this was the way the market worked. And at first, I know Mark and I were sitting there looking at each other going, this market is not intuitive. Because you would think that when you put more resources into the market they would then become cheaper for the factories to purchase because you're, they're being sold from the colonies into the market. You'd think that, oh, well, then when I buy them with my factories, they'll be cheap because there's a lot of them. But you're not actually buying them when you utilize your factory buildings. You are selling processed goods. So the fact that there is a supply of this allows you to sell I guess, to, to make a lot of it and I guess sell you a larger batch or something. The way the market works really was interesting because I know at the beginning of the game, there was a lot of gold colonies and I had a bunch of gold factories and I kept <laughs> hating using them because when I used my factories, it made it more valuable for all of you guys that had gold colonies to sell them. But it was the only way I could get money and I needed money to go build more ship ports because that's what I was doing. But as we got later in the game, you can move on the market all three of the tracks on your market turn, but you can only move them in one direction. So I'm sitting there going, okay, I've got a gold colony and some gold factories. Which of these is it more useful for me to use right now? I'll get points or money either way, but if I use my factories, then I'm making it more valuable for you to use your colonies. You don't have any gold factories, so maybe I'll use my gold colony and drive it down in the direction that only helps my gold factories and makes it worse for you when you go to the market because you only have gold colonies. And there was an interesting push and pull with that market that while it wasn't initially intuitive, was really cool to play throughout the game. I really liked it. And especially since the different commodities are broken up by region. Around Portugal, there is a lot of sugar. In the center of the map, there is a lot of gold. And towards the end of the map, there is a lot of spice you could see the market actions shifting as each of those became flooding into the market. As people built more colonies out in the spice area or built more spice factories, you could see the value of these commodities shifting in the market. And it was really interesting. I really liked it. Yeah, that split up market is definitely the key feature of the game from my point of view as well. Like you really see, I rarely see that kind of thing. I'm thinking about a uh, game like Clans of Caledonia that has a market, but each of the markets is just like this good will go up or down depending on how few sell it or buy it. And that's just kind of how I'm used to seeing markets. So then when you've got that market that the goods are split off, but also production itself is in its own weird zone, it's a very interesting way to think about markets and something that I honestly want to go back to again at some point. I will say one thing I really didn't love about it, though, is the way that the colonies were kind of randomly placed out. You know, you said that as we come up to each, as somebody explores one of the zones, you flip over all the tokens there and you're going to learn which payout it is. And like, I don't know, that just feels kind of like a quote unquote old way to do a thing like that, where you've got these a bunch of these tokens. And I don't know, it might be 60. It might be 170. It felt super swingy to me. Well, at the same time, each of the different zones, which were... I believe they were equal to the zones for the sugar, the gold, and the spice. Each of the zones had 
one of each of the different value tokens. The earlier one started, I think, at 40, and then the second one started at 50, and the third one started at 60. Mm -hmm. And there was a token for each value increasing by 10 up until you ran out of tokens. So you could see, okay, the first person to flip over, that was completely random. Um, but once you flip them over, okay, well, the the 150 here is gone, and the 110 is gone, and, oh, well, also the 50 is gone. So you can see a little bit of what has already been shown, and that narrows down what might be under those further exploration points. And it also allows you to see what is going to be cheap to build a colony in, because mm -hmm. not only do you get money for exploring in a zone, but you have to pay money to build a colony there. So even if you go out to a zone that has a really cheap payout for exploration, that means that if you can get around the Rondell to the colony action, you're going to be able to spend a small amount of money to be able to get that token and mm -hmm. tokens Sorry. and expl exploration t tokens. So the, the colony tokens and the exploration tokens are both going to be worth points to you at the end of the game. So I feel like it's not a game-breaking thing if you get a cheap colony because okay. your payout may not be huge but it's also going to let you get other points cheaper later down the game i'd really like to see a lot of the stuff in this game repurposed into something that's a little more i don't know interesting to me i'm just like i'm so exhausted and i understand that this game is nine years old so at the time it wasn't as rote i guess in a way but i'm so exhausted by colonialism themes and just this old you know, world kind of theme of, oh, let's just go sail and find spice. And take it over. Yeah, exactly. That definitely is not a positive part of it. But, you know, I would like to see some of this. St I would like to see a lot of these things, especially that market kind of re-implemented, because I feel like there's a lot of awesome ideas in this game. Yeah, the theme, I agree with you. The theme was nothing. The theme was not helpful to this game at all. But there were a lot of interesting choices. So I would, I would probably play this game again if somebody put it down in front of me and was like, hey, let's play this. But it's not something I'm probably going to call out. Yeah. Although, honestly, the more I think about it, my initial reaction was like, oh, that was fine. I played it. It was fine. But the more I think about it, like, the more I do want to try it again to mm -hmm. see if I can try a different strategy, something that's not build a lot of boats <laughs> and boat building buildings. See if and, we can get some of the cathedral before Michael buys them all. Well, I mean, that he was smart he to do strategy. that. It was oh, worth yeah. a ton of points to him. Mm -hmm. And it allowed him to get other point scoring opportunities but like the more i think about it the more i do want to try it again which i guess is the sign of a good euro so yeah navigador Navigadora. give it a shot there it is next up we have the hear me's this is a 2017 release from haba games plays three to four players in 15 to 20 minutes it is designed by wolfgang Lehmann, and it just is art is done by the haba team it is kind of listed as uh not applicable on board game geek so this is a game of scritching and scrawling and leaning into here if that is a line or a curve and fun fact on this one hear me's is rated as a 2.2 weight game on board game geek which is equal to robo rally treasure island hot shots and fuji and this is heavier than arboretum which is weighted 2.18 so yeah, think about that one for a second as we describe this Haba game for kids. I mean, the most important takeaway to me from that is that Arboretum is weighted absolutely incorrectly. <laughs> that game should be way, way higher based on the amount of brain burn it creates. <laughs> Danielle, tell us how complicated and un intuitive Hear Me's is. <laughs> well, Hear Me's is a game for children, as you said, and it is going to come with a couple of different components. Everybody will have a player screen that they will have uh to keep they will hide all their snacks behind yeah they'll hide their snacks behind goldfish. it goldfish and when they are the supervisor of the f facility they will also have half of a piece of velcro so if you're, you're familiar with how velcro works you know there is a loop side and a hook side uh the hook side is sort of scratchy and you don't really want to rub your face on it and the hook the loop side is soft and furry and we don't need to worry about it because it's not in the hair maze you just have a big, like, four-by-four four square of the hook side. It's all scratchy hooks from here. You also have a stick, which looks like a pencil with no graphite in it. <laughs> At the beginning of the game, you are going to lay out a group of tiles in the center, and each of these tiles have a building on them, and they have a number of points. They will all be face down, however, so all you know at the beginning of the game is that there are buildings. Everybody is going to get the card that has the different options of things that may be scritched out 
by the supervisor at any point. There are two groups of, of cards that may be used. There are the yellow ones, which are easier to identify, theoretically, and having looked at them, I agree with that. And there are the blue ones, which are more difficult to identify. If you're playing with actual children, I would suggest using the yellow ones. So the person who is the supervisor is going to take the little wooden stick and move the Velcro behind their shield, and they are going to flip over the top card from the deck. It will have a picture of one of the 25 symbols that everybody else is looking at. They are then going to take the stick and they are onto the Velcro using the exact same number of lines and dots, scratch out the thing that is on their card. So maybe it is a rake or maybe it is a sailboat or an apple or any number of other identifiable objects on the yellow ones and slightly harder to identify objects on the blue ones. <laughs> everybody else is going to listen to their scritching and then take their little hear me's token behind their shield and try to guess what has been scratched out by the supervisor. If at least one other player guesses correctly, then the supervisor and that player are going to get to each flip over one of the tiles from the center, and if it is a building they don't yet have in their neighborhood, place it in front of them. And if it is something that they already have in their neighborhood, they will take whichever is the higher point value, the one they already have or the one they've just flipped over, put it in front of them and take the other one and put it back where the, the tile they had just taken was, again, face down. The object of the game is to be the first person to have all of the different buildings that are available, all five different types of buildings that are available in their neighborhood. If at the end of a, the round in which someone gets the fifth type of building, more than one player has gained all five buildings just because they've all drawn it on the same round. Whoever has the most points on their buildings is going to be the winner. One thing I didn't say is that if nobody correctly guesses what the supervisor was drawing, then nobody gets to take any buildings. So it is to the supervisor's advantage to be able to get at least one person to figure out what this is. And if everybody gets it, that means everybody's drawing tiles and they're not going to be getting any like edge on the other players. But at the same time, there is a certain amount of luck because you are drawing these tiles face down and you want to get different ones. So there's some memory elements. There's some hearing elements, which I think we're going to come into play when we talk <laughs> about this game. But it is a very light game. It is a lighter than Arboretum game. I don't know. The numbers don't lie. And they spelled, you know, the numbers lie. Arboretum. All right. Rule number one of Arboretum. Don't play Arboretum in a loud place. We're not playing Arboretum. We're playing rule the Hear Me's. Rule number one of Hear Me's, don't play Hear Me's in a loud place. Correct. <laughs> because you are listening to somebody literally rub a stick on half a piece of Velcro. It is not a loud noise. It mm. is a very quiet noise. And you're trying to listen for the number of lines that they've drawn and... A lot of these have dots in them, and the dots are essentially just you tapping, and it's not very easy to hear. You can ask the supervisor to repeat their drawing once, but that's it. That's all you get. You get two scratches. And if you're playing this anywhere that's got any kind of ambient noise, or if you're playing it with children who may not be great at sitting very quietly and listening, you're not going to hear what the supervisor did. Rule number two of Hear Me's. I'm actually surprised how well Hear Me's worked, though. Like, I didn't expect to be able to hear the difference between a line and a curve, but more often than not, it's pretty clear. I think that they, they hit on the component as good as it could be, and that was something that really, really impressed me about Hear Me's. Yeah, because they tell you that you need to draw the card that you flipped over with exactly the same number of lines and curves and dots and everything, you can just sort of count and be like, okay, I heard for sure two lines that were slow, and then I saw, or not saw, heard five lines that were real quick, which indicates to me that they were at least close together because mm -hmm. you have to draw. That's probably the broom because you've got the broom handle and the mm -hmm. crossbar, and then all the bristles are like right up and down right next to each other. Or, you know, I heard f five dots, and there's only one thing on here that has five dots. So you know what? That, it has to be that <laughs> die looking one. They did a good job of distinguishing the drawings from an auditory standpoint beyond what you would have thought was the case just mm -hmm. looking at the card speaking of the card yes there are only two of those little extra cards or i'm sorry three of those little extra cards involved in the game so if you're playing with more than three people people have to share those cards and pass them around yeah so the supervisor doesn't actually need one mm -hmm. but it it does feel like okay, just throw in an extra one so that you have... You could have four, five, six, eight people play this thing. Could just do it. It just, yeah. I mean, you, you could definitely do that if they provided the components, but they're saying it's a three to four player game. Mm -hmm. Give me one more. Give me a fourth <laughs> one. <laughs> Photocopier, here we come. 
No, I mean, there's not a whole lot more to say about Hear Me's other than I was, uh, I was I had fun with it. It was nice, fun little thing. I don't really understand why we picked this one up, but I just kind of like picked. It was Gen Con. I, I, I you know, I was I at the Hobba asked, booth. I had asked you to pick it up from the Hobba booth because yeah. I was interested in how this scritching thing worked because yeah. it is so different than anything else that I can think of. Like, there's no other game where it's I'm going to sit here and quietly listen to what picture you might be making mm-hmm. on the Velcro. But it is certainly interesting, mm-hmm. and I have a feeling that it's the kind of thing that would be neat to play with kids, but that they might get frustrated by when they can't guess what it is. Yeah, so if you have kids that are able to sit quiet for, what is it, uh, 15 to 20 minutes, perhaps the Hear Me's is for you. Well, that pretty much wraps up our recent plays. Danielle, would you like to move on to the main feature of this segment episode, this episode segment? The main sure. Feature. Let's go after this break to a list of 10. Dun dun dun. Dun dun? Dun 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 dun. In Reavers of Midgard, the second standalone installment in the Champions of Midgard universe, you will be taking your clan beyond your own borders on your never ending quest for glory. Each player has a single worker they will place each round, determining one of the actions all players will take, and of course, gaining the strongest version of it for themselves. But be aware of your fellow Vikings, since you get to take a version of the action they select. Use the powerful Reaver cards to recruit crew members and then to rally additional crew to lead your troops or to specialize in one of your actions, increasing its benefits when either you or another player chooses it. Bring territories into your empire, raid keeps and villages, pillage farms, walls, or towers, or even fight sea battles against ships and serpents alike. You can use guaranteed resources you know you have, or take a chance with the dice and hope the favor of the gods is on your side. In the end, only the clan... <coughs> <clears throat> in the end, only the clan with the most glory will triumph in Reavers of Midgard from Grey Fox Games. Grey Fox Games. Quality games. Cleverly crafted. Ah, uh, July. What better time to retrospect on the year that was over six months ago? You know, I- right before all the games come out <laughs> at Gen Con and in Europe yeah. and Essen and all that type stuff, you like- know? We did this last July, and we kind of did a, a redux of our top 10 of the year list, and I thought it was a really good idea, so I wanted to hit it again this year and kind of just make this a regular thing. Halfway through the year, we revisit stuff from 2018, because we had a chance to play in the first six months of the year a lot of stuff, and obviously stuff that was on the top of our list then might have shifted around some. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense to do so. Um, do you want to go through the superlatives that we gave out at the last episode, or at the beginning of the year as well? Sure. Okay. So first superlatives we had was best artwork. You had Root. I had Everdell. No I don't, argument there. <laughs> I don't really see a need to change that. Like, nothing else really blew my mind in terms of art. Uh, yeah, across the board, pretty much happy with that. Best non-miniatures component. I had the Mars Open Tabletop Golf golf Ball, and you had the Expansity Stacking Skyscrapers. I'm sticking with my Mars Open Golf Ball. Uh, I still love that. I know. I have to, like, I have to stick with mine because the Expansity pieces are amazing for what they need to do. Like, they are so simple, but they make that game. Mm-hmm. Being able to see the skyline come about and see, oh, okay, I need to build a, I need to build a four tall building and that's going to look really cool once I do it. They make that game. But I, I wanted to shout out the ambulances from Dice Hospital Ooh, okay. in the deluxe edition. I recently got a chance to play Dice Hospital, and while it was a super fun game, and that's not what we're talking about here, <laughs> the giant, dense ambulances that you divide the dice up into when you choose the groups of dice were very cool, and they did function really nicely. You could set the dice into them and you'd see which ones you were going to take when you took that ambulance. They had the player order on them, so they functioned also as a player oh, cool. order determinant. They were really neat. They were completely unnecessary. And if you buy the game in the non-deluxe edition, then you are just going to get, I believe, cards that function that way. But if you get the deluxe edition, I really like those stupid little plastic ambulances. Oh, man. How I feel bad that I didn't back that just for the ambulances. Well, I mean, they do theoretically sell deluxe upgrade kits for the game, but they are sold out everywhere right now. But, I mean, Miniature Market still has them listed, and Mm. the the Alley Cat Games website still has them listed, so maybe they'll come back into stock at some point. Maybe I'll see them at Gen Con. Maybe. And I'll just buy just the ambulances. (laughs) Uh, biggest disappointment. You had Time Stories Brotherhood of the Coast. I had Rising Sun. Standing by it. Yeah. Madame was not released in 2018. Mm. Moving on. Game I wish I'd played in 2018. You had 20, uh, you had, you had Detective, a modern crime board game, and I had Root, which I still have not played Root, so I can kind of leave that one there. 
Well, Detective, we've gotten a little bit closer to having played. We now have a copy of Detective <laughs> that we got at the Geek Way to the West trade table. So it is on our table waiting to get played, but you've been traveling a whole bunch for work, so we haven't been able to get it to the table. Yes. But I have a feeling that is going to be really exciting, and I'm still really jazzed to play it. Now that we have it, I'm even more jazzed. All right. For game I wish I'd played more of in 2018, you had Quacks of Quedlinburg. I had Star Realms Frontiers. I'm actually changing this one. I'm going to change to Underwater Cities. I actually hmm. did not put Underwater Water Cities into consideration for my top 10 list for this one because I only got that one play at Gamers for Cures and then we started at 4 a.m. and it was a very bad idea to play it at that time. I feel like I'm going to enjoy that game a lot, but I'm not going to judge it on that one play, so I wish I had played it more. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I sort of looked at this category and went, how do I decide what I wish I had played more of a year ago because it's stuff that I have played now. Mm -hmm. So I guess I won't change it because I didn't think that category was still up for evaluation. Yeah. Best Oops. older <laughs> best older game I played for the first time in 2018 obviously wouldn't change as well. because No, that would not change. Yeah, Ponzi Scheme for you and Vinos Deluxe for me. Best party game, however. Definitely you had changed. Monster Match <laughs> and I had Mars Open. What is yours now? Mine is just one. And I, I love Monster Match. It is still a great game. I really enjoy playing it. But just one is phenomenal. Hmm. It has absolutely come out a ton for us since we've gotten it recently. And I have a great time every time we play it there are always those moments where you're like oh somebody else is going to put the obvious thing so i'm not going to put the obvious thing and then nobody puts the obvious thing or everybody puts the same word and you're like oh i guess we should have spread that out a little bit better <laughs> and you end up with like three words that have nothing to do with the clue that somebody has to try and guess from it is super fun and i love it well danielle i'm gonna have to go back on this podcast and erase that entire thing because i'm also choosing just one as my party game of the year for last nice. year nice so everybody forget what you just heard except don't because just one is actually pretty dang good yeah uh best app you had gone Sean clever i had knock mall i'm not changing anything there knock mall is even better they've added three more maps to it so now i have six of them i've scored above 40 on five out of six i am so close to getting that last one over 40 points. <laughs> I'm going to stick with the Gonchon Clever app, if only because Gonchon Clever makes me want to play it on the app. I have since played the physical copy a couple more times, and I just want to play it on my phone. <laughs> I don't want other people involved in my Gonchon Clever, which is just probably a terrible thing to say, but Get you know what? my guns. It is a very good game on the app. I do want to give like a, a secondary hat tip to, like Indi to Indian Summer, which came out last year, I mm -hmm. believe, and that game is really great on the app as well. It gets rid of a lot of the fiddliness with the tokens that the actual physical game has. We talked about this when we were talking about the Poly Uve episode. And it is it is just a really good app. The art is done well. The game is really well done on the phone and I liked it a lot. But I'm going to stick with Gonchon Clever because that game has made me want to not play it on the table. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, we had most innovative game. You had Nyctophobia and I had Keyforge slash Discover Lands Unknown, specifically for the unique game system. Yeah, you have any I mean, changes that, to yours? No, I don't. I mean, Nyctophobia is still unlike anything. I mean, honestly, Hear Me's might be kind of one of the things that is most <laughs> like Nyctophobia, which is strange because those games are A, very different in their theme, and B, very different in who you're supposed to play them with, I would think. Mm -hmm. But they both rely on an odd sense that you wouldn't normally use as your main sense in a game. And I can't think of anything else where you are blindfolded and you are essentially playing by touch with nyctophobia and sort of and very much by ear as well because the person who is playing the the serial killer can very much creep you out with the way that they are addressing you and moving moving around the table specifically Alex specifically Alex yes but I think that there is nothing quite like nyctophobia <laughs> yeah if if there is it's hear me's which is just Weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is our changes to our superlatives. Uh, not a whole lot of changes, just one that particularly mattered, and it was party <laughs> game. Ha. Good segue, me. So good. Okay, so when it comes to our 2018 Redux list, when we do our end of the year episode, we do our six pack of our top six games. When we do the Redux, we kind of just sh sort everything out and we take our top ten and talk about it from there. Why do we do it that way? Um, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. It's more it's more fun to me to do the 10 list, especially for the Redux, because we go through it a lot quicker, I think. And it's fair enough. Um, I don't know. I think also because if stuff shakes out of our six, it might be in the eight to 10 or the seven to 10 zone. And fair it's enough. worth talking about at that point. So for last year or at the beginning of the year, my list looked like this. At number six, I had Mars Open. At number five, I had Passaraya Supermarket Manager. Number four was Quacks of Quedlinburg. Three was Decrypto. Two was Cryptid. And number one was Escape Tales The Awakening. What did you have? 
I had at number six Monster Match, at number five Quacks of Quedlinburg, at number four I had Cryptid, at number three I had Welcome To, two was Gone Strong Clever, and one was Escape Tales The Awakening. Okay, so of your six from last time, how many of them are in your top ten right now? Did all of them make it through? No. Okay. I think we're at about 50%. Okay, I have one that dropped out of my top ten. Of the six. Um, I have miscounted. I have four that are still on my list. Okay. That's still, yeah, I think that's pretty interesting. And this is, like, the reason that I really want to do these Redux is because the fact that something in our top six was able to drop out later on. And I will say, actually, that uh, the one that did drop out placed at, like, 12 for me. So it's not like it disappeared forever. It just there's a number of other things that kind of filtered it, their way up as well. So it's kind of interesting to look at in that particular way. Yeah. So... I don't know. Do you have anything else you want to say about the process of making the list? Was anything really surprising to you as you were going through it this time around? I mean, the way I went through this time around is actually kind of similar to the way I went through originally, which is, to me, a little bit counterintuitive now Mm -hmm. that I think back on it. I didn't take my old list and then readdress it with new things. Because of the way BGG works, it's actually easier for me to just go through and filter out everything that I've played that had a release date of 2018. Yeah. And then I took that list, made a short list, and ran that through a completely different new pub maple. Mm -hmm. So everything from my original six was on that short list that I put through, but some of them just didn't end up in the top 10 that we're going to be talking about. Yeah, I honestly, I do it the same way, and I really like doing it that way because I don't want to be influenced by my old list when I do the new list. Obviously, I know what my number one was. I obviously, you know, know Escape Tales and Cryptid were stuff that were super high when I did the list at the beginning of the year, but I'm also probably going to continue to rate those games high because they did so good and are doing good and stuff. I will say, of the ones that were on my list, uh, the six that I had picked, Cryptid is the one that fell the farthest. Aww. I mean, I still like that game, and we did just get a chance to play it recently, mm-hmm. but it just, while it was fun and interesting, it's just not something that's hit the table a ton for us, and that just may be because people who like Deduction got a lot of plays of it when we first played it, okay. and we've moved on to sort of playing other things, which is the nature of a podcast. Mm-hmm. But you know, a lot of the other games that, were, that do make my top ten between 6 and 10 are new. Okay. I will say that. Huh. Well, you want to get into it? Sure. All right. My number 10 on the new 2018 Redux list is Decrypto. Yes, all the way down from 3 down to number 10. Decrypto, I still really like it. It just never comes out, primarily because you're not a big fan of it, I think. But I had also, forgotten it came out last it year. It requires a very specific number of people. I need to play it with 6 or 8, and those are really tough player counts to get, but I still really love the way that Decrypto works. Uh, Decrypto is a word game where you are trying to communicate a secret code to the other players on your team by giving them a sequence of clues that tie into uh, code words that only your team can see. The other team is trying to guess those code words or at least intercept the code so that they can figure out what the code that they're supposed to give back is. I think it's a really awesome game. There is an expansion deck or something coming out at Gen Con this year. Super excited to see what that contains because hopefully that'll get it back to the table again my number 10 decrypto my number 10 is between two castles of mad king ludwig which is a game we've actually just gotten to play recently but it is a game that combines two different games that we liked but had a little bit of problems with each of it combines obviously between two cities and castles of mad king ludwig castles of mad king ludwig was a really fun game and we liked the room placement but it felt like there was not really enough spatial impact in that game like you placed all the rooms together, but it didn't feel like you had a puzzle of trying to make the best absolute c- combination of rooms in all the right places. Mm-hmm. And Between Two Cities was fun, but it was kind of dry on the theme. Like, you had to take all the shops and put the shops in a line, which was really nice. But it wasn't it wasn't super thematic and fun, and it did feel a little bit like if you played it with a lot of people, you were playing just with three people, and everybody else was also at the table. No big deal. Yeah. Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig took that spatial thing that I wanted from Castles of Mad King Ludwig and made it front and center. I really enjoyed the way that you could plan out how you could set yourself up for future placements, what you were hoping to pass around, how you could best spread the points between the two castles that were building on either side of you. It took the best parts of both of those games, and it really gave them to me in a way that I was excited to play again. I am excited to play again. The production on it is also amazing with the game trays that sort everything out into the nice little ways that they need to be sorted. 
I had a really fun time with this, and I want to play this again. I want to teach it to a bunch of people. I want to play it more in our group. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting that back to the table as well, leaving it in the game night bag for a while to come for sure. Cool. My number nine is Spring Meadow. Hmm. This is a game, obviously, we talked about when we talked about the Uwe Rosenberg polyomino games, and this, I believe I had said at the time, was my favorite of those games to play on the table. It is a really easy teach. It is a nice table presence. The Tetris pieces are always fun to, to break out and try to make the best shapes out of them. I really enjoyed it. I didn't think I was going to enjoy it. We didn't actually pick this game up intentionally. I won this at the Geekway to the West Play to Win. But since we played it at Geekway and brought it home and played it since, it's come out a ton of times. And when it came out of our game night bag the other day, like you were packing games and you're like, oh, these are going in. These are going to come out for a little while. And you had taken Spring Meadow. I was like, oh, but, <laughs> but Spring Meadow. And then I realized, you know, we played it a bunch of times with a lot of people in our group and we only bring so many games. It's fun to bring new stuff. But I, I was genuinely bummed that you had taken it out of the bag. And I was like, Aww. oh, okay. Maybe I like Spring Meadow more than I thought I did. So that's my number nine game from 2018. Spring Meadow. My number nine from 2018 is Star Realms Frontiers. I'm actually kind of surprised that this didn't make my list last year. It was probably in that kind of seven to ten kind of zone. Did we play it last year? Yeah, we played it before Gen Con. Uh, because I remember it was uh, we had a chance to play all of the stuff right before Gen Con. And we were raving about it. It was in our Hype List episode. So right about this time last year is when we picked up Star Realms Frontiers. And, yeah, I just didn't think we had played it. <laughs> oh, yeah. But Star Realms Frontiers takes that Star Realms deck building foundation and basically is where it grows up. There's so much additional content in there. I feel, especially once you get the command decks, obviously being a huge part of that in there, and you have variable setups, and the cards themselves in Star Realms from Fear, I feel are balanced in a new and interesting way that makes the game ramp up more exciting and more effectively so that you don't have 45-minute games that go nowhere and you don't have 10-minute games that are just a complete blowout. It feels a lot more balanced to me in the way that the cards are set up. And again, those commander decks and giving you different events, different gambits and stuff like that, and you're tied in with whatever your special character's powers are, it really just gives me what I want that system to be. So I really hope they continue to give us more content for Star Realms, give us maybe some kind of campaign decks that I'm able to play more solo once I'm off of the app as well. I would love to see more of that content in the future so I can continue playing more Star Realms Frontiers. And I know in our variants episode that we did on this and Hero Realms, we talked about how with Frontiers, it makes them comparable games because mm -hmm. Hero Realms had so much more like campaign and character based content originally. But Frontiers really brings the sci fi version of that game up to a comparable level. So it's cool. And you are much more a sci fi fan than a fantasy fan. So <laughs> Very true. That is unsurprising to me that you like that. Mm -hmm. Star Realms Frontiers, my number nine. All right. My number eight is Teotihuacan. Huh. Yeah. On one play of this at Geekway this year, I've decided that this needs to be in my top 10 of the year because I am so excited to dig back into that and learn more about what's going on in that game. Well, it's a good thing we have it then. Oh, yeah, very true. And when we were playing it at Geekway, I remember the first half of the game, I'm just sitting there just like, I am way in over my head on this thing. I have no idea how I'm supposed to get efficient at this. And there was like the last three or four turns of the game, I started to find, oh, I can do this and this together to make this happen. And it's just, that's like the Euro gamers dream right there, where you're just like, seeing that next level of strategy in there. And I know that there's probably three, four, five layers deeper in Teotihuacan that I can learn as we continue to play this game more. Had I had a chance to play this more and, you know, play it, if we had gotten to like a full six pack or something by now, I would not be surprised if this one charted way higher for me. But on just the strength of getting in there and getting a feel for what it is, I'm definitely putting it in my number eight spot. That's Teotihuacan. My number eight is going to be Coimbra which is a game, I believe you had said it was your game that you had wanted to play this mm -hmm. year, or in 2018 on our original list. And we have obviously gotten a chance to play it. I think we've talked about it in a six-pack since then. Yes. And it is a fun game. I really enjoy what it does. I really enjoy the art that goes with what it does. Everybody is always talking about this game as if it is so great. And I was a little bit hesitant when we played it. I was like, everybody loves this game. This game is like... There can't be a game that everybody loves. <laughs> That's not going to work. There's going to be something wrong with it. But we played it, and I really did enjoy it. It's not the kind of game where I'm, like, aching to get it back to the table, but it is fun. And 
I enjoy what it does. I enjoy how you need to manage your pilgrim movement and you need to manage the different types of cards that you're getting into your hand, making sure that you get immediate points and round bolstering points, to say the least, the C and E cards that give mm -hmm. you additional benefits on each of the different parts of the round. I really like the way that the tracks are manipulated. You're trying to race up some of those tracks so you get extra points for getting up at the top, but you also want to make sure that you move up on each of the different tracks so that you have the resources that you need throughout the game. But it also doesn't feel really dry like a lot of times like we were talking about earlier. You know, you move up the track, you move and balance this. Oh, yay. But it really does feel fun when you're doing it. And I enjoyed it. So my number eight is going to be Coimbra. I'm going to talk about that later. No, really? <laughs> yes. I'm so surprised. Mm. I was surprised. So very surprised. Danielle, tell me about your number seven. My number seven is going to be Dice Hospital. Oh, and okay. if you have any look at my Steam history, that is going to be not surprising at all, because Dice Hospital is essentially the board game version of Two Point Hospital, a game into which I have put at least 80 hours on Steam. <laughs> it is a planning game where you are putting different rooms and different staff into your hospital to try to take in different patients of varying degrees of severe injury, and you are using the benefits of the different personnel that you have and of the specialized rooms that you have to treat them more efficiently. You also only have so many hands on staff at your hospital at one time. So some of those patients are not going to get treated every round and you need to make sure that you manage who is getting treated each round so that you don't have people passing away because they've not been treated because that's bad hospital management. <laughs> you shouldn't let that happen. But you can also only take in so many patients into your hospital and you're going to be having to take in a steady stream every round. It is a really nice puzzle to solve on a theme that I already liked. And uh, like I said, it has those really cool deluxe ambulances. If you get to play with those, a benefit, but not why. This is my number seven game, mm. Dice Hospital. I'm a little bummed that I haven't had a chance to play this one yet either. So hopefully I get a chance to get at that one at some point. And maybe we can uh, do a review of it at some point later. That would be good. Mm. I would like that. <laughs> My number seven is Blue Lagoon. This is another game that I had a chance to play at Geekway, and it's one of the few games that if like we kind of go back and talk about games in the past, games that I've played and either ordered immediately after or while playing. Uh, I think Coimbra is another one from this year that I ordered pretty much immediately on the spot. Mm -hmm. Terraforming Mars was another one of that. And something about Blue Lagoon just got in my brain. And it's still to this day, I'm thinking about it. And it might have also come that it, I, we had a chance to play it maybe a few months after I played Twixt, that old 1979 uh, line connecting game from so long ago. The Blue Lagoon definitely has a feel of in that you are trying to connect long lines of your pieces across the board. And in a three or four player game, that means you've got a lot of players that you're going to try to maneuver around. And since there's no way to go around or bridge over or under somebody else's line, somebody's going to get that line connected and somebody's not. And I just love that do or die kind of feel in a route building game like this. And obviously when like, you know, me and Jeff get into it and we're playing and you obviously can just go on with your day and make your great little routes, it works out best for you. But I, in my defeat, still enjoyed every second of playing Blue Lagoon. There is something to be said for staying out of the way of the fight. There were other <laughs> strategies in that game and I just used the other ones. You absolutely did, and it's 100% right. Nothing wrong about that. But, yeah, I mean, I just, I freaking love it, and I just want to continue playing this game a lot. It's well, just good. We're in the fun. middle of a six-pack for it, so <laughs> we better continue playing it. All right. Well, my number seven, there it was, Blue Lagoon. My number six game of 2018 is the one that will probably raise the most eyebrows. Danielle, are you ready to hear what card game I placed at my number six? Yeah, sure. It's Keyforge. Huh. I actually put Keyforge in my top 10, and not just my top 10, it's in my six pack of you top hate games of Key 2018. Forge, Jake? I don't know, maybe this is the redemption arc where I find a, a way to love the card game that's so. Basically, just Alex screwed me over that one oh, time. Oh, come on, stop complaining. <laughs> no, I mean, all joking aside, it was a rough first play, but even after that first play, I saw, okay, there's something really interesting here, and we've gotten to the point where we have, well, probably 15 or so decks, and we've played them all against each other, and I felt like every game of Keyforge played differently, and that's what's been so interesting to me about it is that I'm not one for CCGs. I've never played Magic more than, you know, a handful of games back when it first started out. But the fact that I can go in with any deck of Keyforge and for the most part be kind of competitive against the other person on the street makes me feel really excited about it. It makes me excited to continue playing more and more of it. And just the, the thrill of opening up that deck and just being like, 
oh wow, this has this card and this card in a way that I've never thought about combining before. Rather than sitting there and digging through a whole bunch of cards and being like, oh, I could do this card A and this card B and forcing myself to come up with those synergies there. It's more about taking advantage of what you're given, which is a really exciting way for me to think about a dueling card game like that. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. it's unsurprising that once you learn the meta of a card game, you are liking it more. Mm -hmm. It's just surprising that you got through the point where you learned the meta. Yes. Well, there it is. My number six is Keyforge. My number six is going to be Gonshan Clever on my phone. Um, <laughs> because I, again, like I said earlier, really uh, don't want to play it with people. Um, but it is a good game. It is a game I'm still playing really regularly, which the rate apps have come out for games, even at this point, or even frankly, the way I just ignore stuff that it ends up on my phone. It's surprising to me that I am still playing games of this. Even with Doubled So Clever having come out, I'm still playing the original Gonshan Clever app. I'm really enjoying it, and I think it's a really just a clever roll and ride. I like it, I like it a lot, and I'm gonna keep playing it. Gonshan Clever, my number six. Cool. Not much more I can say about it. No. My number five is gonna sound kind of familiar because it is your number six. It is Keyforge. Oh, okay, good. I enjoy Keyforge a lot and I'm really excited to play the new batch of cards we got our- Age of Ascension. Yes, we got our blue cards in. And you had asked me, you're like, oh, did you open them up? And I'm sitting here going, what am I gonna open them up for? You weren't home, so I'm not, I'm not just gonna sit here and look at them. I would have opened them up and looked at every single card. I know you would have, <laughs> but I'm excited to go through those decks and play them against each other. Like you said, it's fun to get to learn what you can do with the different combinations and see how this new arc of cards is gonna be interesting and different from the first one. I'm excited mm -hmm. about that. And that's keeping Keyforge at a number five for me. My number five is one that was my number six from last year. This is one of few, actually, um, now that I'm looking at it, the only one that moved up a spot. Really? And that is Mars Open Tabletop Golf. Huh. Well, we don't have a whole lot of opportunities to bring out Mars Open because, you know, you need space to flick your golf ball around. The design of it is so freaking smart. That golf ball, this folded piece of reinforced paper, it flies in such an interesting way, and I just love this thing so much. It's such a cool component. It's probably my favorite dexterity game of all time at this point. There's just so much versatility in the base box, and obviously if you have multiple boxes, you can combine it however you want to make the craziest courses you can think of. I'm super hopeful that there's some expansion content on the way for this. I know that's something that Dennis over at Bellwether Games wants to do, mm -hmm. so hopefully we get to see more Mars Open in the near future, because that is my number five game of 2018. Mars Open Tabletop Golf. Cool, cool. Moving on, my number four was my number four last year, and that one is The Quacks of Quedlinburg, this bag-building game that came from North Star Games, designer Wolfgang Warsh. I mean, what a surprise. It's still there. We, it was on my number four, I think, after having like one or two plays of it before we even got to do a full review early this year. And unsurprisingly, it's continuing to be there as we've played more and more with the different tile sets to give the different tokens more powers or different powers. It's been more and more interesting. It continually comes out at game night. People are always grabbing Quacks of Quedlinburg. And with an expansion on the horizon, I feel like there's a lot of staying power with this game as well. So yeah, I mean, no surprise there. I don't think I need to say a whole lot more. My my number four, Quacks of Quedlinburg. I'm actually not going to say any more because my number four is also Quacks of Quedlinburg. So <laughs> you just said all the things that expansion is, should be available at, at Gen Con, I believe, in the U.S. It's already available mm -hmm. in Europe. So I am excited for more Quacks of Quedlinburg. The Crowter Hexen. The Hex Witches or something like that. Yeah. My number three is Welcome To. And it is a game that I'm excited. You had mentioned earlier in this episode that we have the new pads. And I'm excited to play those new pads because... While Welcome To is still fresh and new, I enjoy it, but I'm, I'm curious to see what they've added in each of those notepads, because I know they're not just, oh, a new re-theme of the same thing. It, there are some changes to the way you play, correct? Mm -hmm. There's changes to them, and there's uh, additional cards in, in each of those sets as well, so there's more diversity to the way the game is played. Cool, and I'm excited about that, because this game is still fun. It's a nice flip-and-fill game. You can play it with literally any number of people. You can play it, well, I guess you probably can't play it alone. But you can play it with... I think there's a solo rule set. Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, you can play it with up to hundreds of people. I mean, I know Mile High Game Guys did it online at one point. Mm -hmm. We've played it at... at um, whose turn is it anyway? We've played in a giant room of people where they had posted the pictures up on, <laughs> up on the internet. And it's just a fun game. It's really interesting. And it is, it is well-themed, which is nice. I mean, we joke about sometimes you get 
uh, write, roll and writes or flip and fills or whatever that are just really about putting the number in the right place and the theme is not important. But welcome to the theme makes sense and it makes it feel more like you're actually doing something. I really like the way that game plays and I'm excited to try the new sheets for it. Hmm. That is welcome to. My number three game is Cryptid. This one actually just slipped one spot, which will Aww. not be a huge surprise to anybody. But Cryptid continues to come out at our game nights. I love it. It is one of the best deduction games I've ever played. And I love just like wandering by another player's or another game of it and watching somebody else be playing it and just kind of like taking a look at the stuff on the board and just trying to figure out from what I know about the way the game works, what kind of rules there are in the game. What can I get just by looking at this board and say, oh, okay, so this player has the not within two of the bear enclosure or something like that. And I just, it's such a, an interesting game that once you've played a few times and you really get into the meta of the way the game works, you get to start thinking in terms of the way that the game fits together and start to really see those patterns in a deep and exciting way. So I really adore Cryptid. I'm sure it's, you know, not for some people, especially people who prefer social deduction over deduction. But for raw deduction, I feel that Cryptid is one of the best that you can get. But maybe they don't have that within two of a bear enclosure. Maybe they're just bluffing really well. No, I know where their bears are. Oh. I've, I've seen the bears. They're there within two. Okay, cool. Yeah. Speaking of two, my <laughs> number two is the highest new entrant on my list, and nobody is surprised. That is Coimbra. Uh, yeah, again, we played this at uh, Whose Turn Is It? We played this at Whose Turn Is It Anyway back in January. I ordered it on the spot. We did a six-pack of it a few weeks later. Holy moly, there is so much about this game that I enjoy. You've got dice rolling. You've got dice drafting. You've got engine building with the cards that you get into your tableau. You've got all these different variables of the different endgame points, scoring things you're going to get. You've got that pilgrim movement track that I just freaking love. And that's my favorite thing to play around with is just a movement track that you get to get a whole bunch of rewards off of. There's so much fun and interesting combinations and interesting connections every time I play a game of Coimbra. Um, I adore it. It's freaking awesome. And I understand why a lot of people really like it. I also understand why people don't like it. Like, there's not a huge amount of variability because you will see every card every game. But depending on the circumstances you get and the dice you get, it's going to obviously change the way that you're going to play. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's my number two, Coimbra. My number two is just one. We talked about earlier mm. how this game has come out all the time in our game group and how it is both of our favorite party game that came out last year. It is so interesting to try to come up with the right clue, to try to come up with the right mix of clues, and it plays just really quickly. Everybody is on the same team, so you don't need to worry about you know, be, whether you're on the team with somebody who's a really good clue giver or you're on the team with somebody who's maybe not the best clue giver, which can happen in team games, decrypto, co code names, that kind of thing. Here, everybody's working together and you're just trying to get this thing to, so that everybody can guess the word, but you don't want to give the same clue. It is so simple to teach, but so much fun every time. I only wish that there were more words in the game, that it came with more words. And if that's my biggest complaint, that just means I've played it so many times that we're starting to repeat cards. So my number two game is Just One. As I was watching us play Just One the other day, I thought to myself, could you swap out other word decks for it? But I really feel like the Just One word deck is clear enough but still wide enough that those words give you a good range of stuff. Because like if you swapped in the cards from Insider or something, I feel like you'd have a really hard time with that. Yeah, the cards from Insider are significantly more targeted. Mm -hmm. The idea with the Just One cards is that there are multiple points of entry to the different cards. Like yeah. One of the cards that we always use in, as an example is Starbucks, which was one of the cards that has been screwed up by our group. <laughs> but because when you're trying to think of something that is not the obvious coffee or Seattle, you know, there are different points of entry. There are different characters named Starbucks, or maybe there's different, like weird types of coffee mm -hmm. or preparations of coffee or sizing from Starbucks. There are so many different points of entry to how to give a clue on that. And that's important. Whereas like nurse, <laughs> there isn't necessarily as much of an obvious clue and there aren't different ways to get in on that. So I think that the deck that they've created is really good at what it does. I just wish it was a bigger deck. Yeah. Just one. Speaking of just one, I'm going to go out on a limb and say we have just one game for our number one game. Am I correct? Yeah, we did not change this. <laughs> yeah. Escape Tales The Awakening is such a breath of fresh air for the narrative escape room puzzly style game that it really like it's still standing on its on its own two feet 
Um, and I so, so excited to see what this system does in the future. We've heard some advance word about what uh, Escape Tales Low Memory is going to be doing, and it's going to be three separate stories. You're experiencing it again from the same point of view three times and learning more about it so you can solve the puzzles and go further each time. Like, wow, I'm so excited to see how that works because of how strong the design in Escape Tales The Awakening was. The puzzles, the aha moments, the tying together of the different pieces, and just the the way that the app worked in a way that wasn't restrictive, it wasn't a timer, it wasn't zapping and buzzing you, it was just giving you the nudges towards progress the whole time. If you needed a hint, here's a little hint for you. If you think you got it, just go for it. There's no penalty for getting it wrong. We want you to learn more and experience this story so you can find your way through it. And that's just a super strong design to me. Yeah, we've passed this game around our group to make sure that everybody who absolutely loved puzzles has gotten a chance to play it. And when I was remaking my list this time, I was sitting there going, okay, it's been a while since I got to play Escape Tales The Awakening, and I'm realistically not going to play it again. You could play through it again, but at this point I'm, I'm probably not going to because I know that Low Memory is coming out, and our copy has been discussed in our group enough times <laughs> that the puzzles haven't really faded from mind as much as they would have if it hadn't gotten multiple plays in our group. Yeah. But I talked about this when I talked about my top 10 games of all time list. Like, the absolute amazing experience that I had when I played through that game the one time I did play through it are not going to be replaced by anything that I've gotten to play from last year. Just One is awesome, but the fun that I have playing Just One is not going to completely top the absolute just gobsmackedness of having played Escape Tales The Awakening. It was the gaming moment of, from last year for us, I feel like. Heck yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, not a whole lot else to say. Escape Tales The Awakening, my number one, your number one, Draft Mechanics number one of 2018. And uh, that's the list. Yeah. Yeah. If you have anything that you want to throw in, if there's any games you picked out from the last few months that would have fit on your list, I'd love to hear about it. I think that maybe I'll just do the final round for next episode now and say, hey, what have you found in the last few months that you wish you had gotten to in 2018? Or what are your biggest surprises that you picked up after the end of the year? I think that's always a good discussion topic, something good to look at. And it would be kind of nice to have the final round be a kind of a reflective on an episode rather than a predictive on an episode. Does that sound like fun? Yeah. Yeah. That they, just means you didn't put it up last week. I didn't put up a final round last week. I'm sorry, everybody. No, it's fine. I'm, I'm excited to hear what people have to say. Yeah, so I uh, will find the better words for that. And Monday, when this episode goes live, you will see it in the Draft Mechanic Slack and also on the Guild, because we're just going to do both those things. Cool. Yeah. Uh, moving on? Sure. Let's go over to the Beer Zone. Want a second opinion on some of the games we talked about on this episode? Check out some other great content creators at punchboardmedia.com. So on the beer segment this week, I wanted to talk about two different pieces of legislation that had recently been passed that I thought were really interesting, and I wanted to share with you guys. So this is where we are going to do that. The first is a law that recently was signed by the Maine governor. And if you recall, we talked about a similar law in North Carolina a couple of months ago, increasing the self-distribution limit. And in Maine, that limit has just been raised to in not only to increase the self-distribution limit, but also to change what is considered a small brewery. It used to be that if you brewed less than 1,600 barrels annually, you were considered a small brewery, which is very small. That is really small. It is. But that number is now 30,000 barrels okay. annually, which is a little bit more than we had previously had in North Carolina, which was under 25,000 was considered for self-distribution. But now, if you brew 30,000 barrels or less annually, you can self-distribute. And the thing that was actually really interesting to me for, about this was not only did it allow you to be considered a small brewery, but it allowed you, if you have not sold more than 10,000 case equivalents, so approximately 725 barrels, in the previous 12-month period, and you have a distributor contract, because previously you would have had to have had a distributor contract if you were above that self-distribution limit. As long as you are not more than 3% of your distributor's sales, you can get out of that contract, which is really interesting because a lot of the problems that small breweries had been having with having to go through third-party distributors was that once they signed a contract with the distributor, at least from the vantage point of North Carolina breweries, which is Ooh. what I am most familiar with, 
once they signed a contract with the distributor, that pretty much existed in perpetuity. They had a very difficult time if they were po- able to at all to get out of that contract. And that distributor was then in charge of the way that brand was sold and given out to their accounts. So this is nice that not only have they increased what is considered a small brewery, but they've given actual very small breweries who had to enter into distribution contracts a way to get out of them. I mean, it is still only for breweries that distributed a very small amount in the previous year. But at the same time, it's it's a way to get out of a contract if you already had one. And if you didn't already have one, it gives a lot more ceiling to breweries that want to self-distribute for themselves. So hopefully mm. you'll be seeing more capital coming into those breweries and they'll be able to flourish as businesses, which is something that we should always want, right? Yeah. The second piece of law that I wanted to talk about was actually from the Supreme Court, so some of the highest law in the country. The Supreme Court recently struck down a residency requirement for liquor licenses in Tennessee. And some of the law that that was existent that they have gotten rid of is just ridiculous to me. But the, the base of it was that previously, in order to open a liquor store in Tennessee, you needed to have lived in Tennessee for two years. There was a residency requirement of two years to get a license, oh. which means that if you are a an out-of-state company, you essentially had a very difficult time opening a liquor store in Tennessee. The other thing that was weird about it, and this is the part that doesn't really make sense to me, is that in order to renew that one-year liquor license, you needed to have lived in the state of Tennessee for 10 years. So in one year, you should have gained eight years of residency. Uh... And that the stock or the shareholders, if you are a publicly traded company, also needed to be located in Tennessee. So this was essentially saying, if you are from Tennessee, you have an advantage in opening a business here, <laughs> which is not how the 21st Amendment is supposed to work. So in a combined effort between a liquor store hopeful owner operator who had moved from Utah to Tennessee but had not lived in Tennessee for two years yet, and Total Wine, which you may remember really? from being Total Wine, um, they had challenged this residency requirement, saying that the protections that were given to states in discerning their own liquor laws in the 21st Amendment during the repeal of Prohibition were meant to ensure health and safety. It, as a state, you are able to mitigate the laws that are are not federal laws in order to preserve the safety of your populace. You are not meant to make these laws in order to promote the business of one group of citizens or of business people as opposed to the others. That is called protectionist laws and they are not covered under the commerce clause. (laughs) So the Supreme Court ruled seven to two in honestly, the first time I can remember that was not down party lines of that Tennessee can't do this. You you can't have this residency requirement. And what that means is not only can Tennessee not do this, but the 20 other states that have similar laws, not necessarily exactly the same, and probably not with the same funny math, but there are 20 other states that have residency requirements for liquor licenses that are probably going to be challenged going forward. I know one of the groups that seemed to have a really positive comment on this was the, the group that represents wine distributors because there are a lot of states where you can't ship wine to them. Um, If you've ever tried to order wine online, it'll ask you where you are shipping to it before it lets you check out because some states just don't let you ship there. And it looked from the comments that were being made about this ruling that that may be the next direction in which these challenges are going because essentially they are saying that they are preferring in-state wine businesses as opposed to out-of-state shipments Mm. so that is where i would expect this to go forward and those also those residency requirements in other states may follow suit on this so i thought that was really interesting that had just happened in i believe the past week or two so these are fairly fresh rulings and it will be interesting to see how that changes interstate alcohol sales and ownership we may see a lot more larger chains going into states where they didn't previously exist, which is not great news for small business owners there. But for people like that that owner who had moved between states, he had moved and he had been a liquor store owner in Utah, which 
I'm not going to make a comment on, but he he wanted to open up a new business in Tennessee, and it, that was his business. But because he hadn't lived there for two years, he was facing this this law that was prohibiting him from opening his business. So it's interesting to see that there will be help to local business owners in the sense that you can come and start a new business there, but there will also be a hindrance because when you look at these interstate larger distribution things, one of the things that they were saying is that that drives down the cost of alcohol and that could be considered a health and safety issue because if alcohol is cheaper, people will consume it more and that is a health and safety issue and that's why the state of Tennessee should be able to have this requirement. Hmm. Now, I feel like we've jumped over a couple of steps there. Alcohol can already be obtained at a cheap value, I would assume. And saying that something is cheap doesn't mean that people are going to create a health and safety issue of it, which is, I assume, why this, the Supreme Court was so overwhelmingly, for a Supreme Court decision, willing to overturn this law. So we will see how that uh, changes the distribution of alcohol, not only craft beer, but also of wine and, I would imagine, spirits going forward. I just hope someday I'll be able to ship a bottle of beer to somebody and they can ship a bottle of beer to me, maybe. Well, I think that has more to do with the fact that you are a person, not a business. I'm a businessman. You're not. I'm not. <laughs> that is not what this law is governing. I know. I know you are just saying. I'm just being very clear. This is about businesses. Yes. Huh. Well, Danielle, I'm sure you'll put some links in the show notes if people want to read up more on those. I certainly will. That is what we do here at Draft Mechanic. And if you would like to find more information about that, perhaps you will go to draftmechanic.net and check out the show notes section there for more information. You can also find us on the internet, on all the social medias, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. It's at Draft Mechanic, as you usually would do for such a thing. We also have a Board Game Geek Guild. That is guild number 2470. You go over there, check out the thread for this episode, check out the final round which for next episode, which will apparently be posted <laughs> there, and check out my poll about future beer segments going forward. Mm-hmm. All sorts of stuff on the Board Game Geek Guild this week. You better get over there. Hey, by the way, while you're there, pick up the Board Game Geek Micro Badge. Nobody's bought the Micro Badge in four weeks, and I'm starting to get worried that we're out of Badgers. <laughs> Save the Badgers, buy a micro badge. We'll give you geek gold. It's a thing. If you happen to be in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, our next meetup is going to be on Tuesday, July 16th at Salud Cerveceria. So we hope to see you there. Mm -hmm. Draft Mechanic is sponsored by Gray Fox Games. Visit grayfoxgames.com and sign up for their newsletter for the latest. Gray Fox Games, quality games, cleverly crafted. Danielle, did you know this is the end of the episode? I did. Hmm. But there's, there's just one more bit. I don't know. What do you mean? It's the part where I remind our listeners to please game responsibly and tell them that I'll see them back here in two weeks for another round. Sounds like a good place to be. I'll see you there. All right. Bye. Draft Mechanic Episode 104 is recorded on Sunday, July 7th, 2019 in front of a live studio cat who really needs his dinner up here. I'm Eric Dewey. And I'm Donald Dennis. And together we are the Mad Men behind Onboard Games. Indeed, for the past dozen years or so, we've been putting out a podcast that you should be listening to. Yeah, it, you know, after you finish listening to this podcast. Exactly. So what do we do on our show, Don? We got a lot of stuff going on. We have a bunch of great guests, and we do an occasional triple play where we take a type of game be it mechanic or theme and we talk it up for a while and we pick hey what's a great introductory version of that game what's a game that is good for people who've been gaming for a long time and what is i don't know a weird or strange version of that type of game but you're thinking as much as i love to hear eric and don i would love to hear other voices too we've got you covered there as well we have isaac shalev bruce vogue the third adrian azell kathleen mercury and of course we have some other special segments from folks who drop in from time to time like brian counter who is counterproductive absolutely and we have the argument hour with seth jaffe and tc petty the third so all kinds of stuff going on over at onboard games and of course the most important thing about onboard games is that we are proud to be members of punchboard media that's right so head over to inversegenius.com which is where onboard games can be found or visit us as our guild in guild 325 on board game geek punchboard media where we all bring something to the table Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com.